Okay. Cool. All right. Here we go. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. Well, first, how how long? Like we known each other what? We uh, like pretty much immediately when me and Danny moved. Uh, Boston. Yeah, I, I was from Boston. Danny's from Israel, but this was two thousand eight. So I think we met in two thousand nine, and we crashed your place. Right. <laughs> I always tell that story about you guys. Just you know, you guys calling just out of the blue and then saying, "Hey, you know, we want." Take a lesson. I said, "Why well, teach drums?" He goes, "No, no, we want we want to meet you. We want you. to take we a want, lesson. Yeah, take yeah, a yeah. lesson." Well, well, we were we were psychopaths back. <laughs> like we're still we still are, but like I'm back in those days, it was like Man. you know we just. I remember like we had a neon, like a little Ford neon. We had all our gear, and we just like knocked, and we forgot there's a lesson, and like Barb was here, and she's like, "Uh, Paul, like you know, like people are." <laughs> Yeah, because I had written it down on you know, the calendar, but we were having dinner. I just was based on it, and all of a sudden I look out, and there's, uh, you know, the sidewalk is just filled to yeah. the street with pedals. And stuff. Yeah, I had and like I go, two pedal no. boards, two twin amps. Yeah, oh my I, I, I got to show people real quick. To, uh, look at all these Grammys. Oh, man. Paul has so many Grammys. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we, that, that was kind of a, 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 wild, a wild experience. But I, I remember, like, you know, the the like the thing about it was so like mind blowing because we just didn't know like what we're walking into, and you know we didn't know what kind of person you are, but we grew up on the records you made, you know. Right. So it was just like you know, just, uh, I hope something happens. We're just like, ah, oh. like you know, yeah, this, yeah. this could be fun. We and could then do something. and then I just told you to like you know go to the basement, set up, and then you know I'll come down after dinner, <laughs> and then you know I'm expecting like. The worst to be honest with you, because I'm thinking, oh no, you know. And then you guys started playing immediately. I love what you were doing. I thought, oh man, you guys would be a great augmentation to the the trio. You know? Yeah, yeah, which we did. That's great. Crazy, man. So I was, I was thinking, like, you know, one of the pivotal moments, like for me and Danny, when yeah. we were starting out, uh, I remember you you were telling us that like. You know, after like the whole like you know the theme experience and like you know touring all that stuff like that, I think you talked to Billy Martin, the dude from Rescue Martin and Wood, right. and he told you something like you know like get in a van. Yeah, you got to go out and, and pay your dues. Yeah, yeah, right. like get, but yeah. you're like you know it's like you've been in a van. I've done that. I yeah. mean, with the Simon and Bar group before playing with uh, Matheny, you know, I mean that's what we did. We basically would you know highball it out to you know Seattle, like forty eight hour drive, and play. You know, some college uh, cafeteria at noon or something. You know, I mean, it was crazy. So, to hear that was like, okay. You know, I, yeah, yeah, but I, like, it's I so funny because you were telling it to us, like, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, fuck this. Like, I already did that. Like, you know, I lived that oh, life. Man. And we were, we were just, we were like, I don't know, like 23 at the time, right, you know, and right. we were just listening to it, like, huh, yeah, okay, we're going to get in the van. <laughs> Well, I mean, it did. was fun. I mean, when you're young, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a blast because, you know, you get a chance to see the country and, just, you know, experience, you know, different audiences and different... How long was your, like, that, that before Matheny, like, how long were you, like, just touring and, like, doing that? A couple years. I mean, I think I started with them, I don't know, probably around, no, well, maybe 80 or 79, 80. So, yeah, probably about, you know, a good two or three years we did that. It's like, like, mid to late 70s? No, actually, no. It would have been like either late seventy, like seventy nine, or eighty into eighty three. Okay. You know. How, what's the, what's the difference? <laughs> what's the <laughs> do, difference do, do, do you of, remember, of what? Do you remember touring in those days? Oh, I like, remember everything about everything. Yeah, yeah, like I don't, I don't even know how you go about going anywhere without your iPhone. You know, it's like we, like, how do you get a hotel? Like, you just, how do you know where you're going? <laughs> you know, well, that's <laughs> interesting. I never, you know, I, I don't haven't put that in in that kind of frame of mind. Yeah, we just, I guess, you would just stop and call somewhere, you know, use a pay phone. Or How do you it. find the places? It's like, it seems like, right, I'm, like, we grew up, yeah, and, right, right. like, when we started touring, it was, like, right at the beginning of Google Maps, mm -hmm. and, like, you know, we'd still have to, like, kind of, there was, there was no direction, but you could kind of see the line and follow it, yeah. but... You guys had maps, right? Right. Like, we would have you, maps. How did you book the gigs? How did you know? If, like, a well, gig? I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with that. You know. So, so you got in the van, and I just got in the van, and, and you know, and, and played. With, you know, and and you know, there were wild times. I mean, I remember once um, playing in New York. I think with, with Paul Berliner or whatever. And, and so Barb and I drove out to New York, and then we had to kind of highball it back 
to Chicago because I was going to fly out to Portland and meet them because they had my drums and everything. And, you know, so we highballed back, you know, exhausted. We could have stayed in New York and had a good time. We get back, and then I get to the airport, and there's, like, like a message from the airport saying the gig is canceled. <laughs> from so, the airport. Yeah, yeah, you know, stuff like that. And, yeah, so now you would just get an email or text or whatever. But yeah, back then it was totally Yeah, totally I mean, just the, com- the, com- the, like, tour managing was a real job. Right. Well, you know, it's like now, like, we do everything. We right. book, we, you know, drive, right. we, and, and it's all, like, easy. You know? it's, right, and the other thing I really remember, even with, with Matheny, is that you know, to call home. So you're, you're in Europe or Japan, and you know, you would call, and you, you know, if you use the hotel, so expensive. I mean, it was ridiculously expensive. I think I remember being in Germany once, and Pedro Asnar made a 20 minute call to like Argentina from Germany, and he got down to pay his bill, and it was like six hundred dollars for the phone call. I just wow. remember him like, you know, and I was just like, what? <laughs> Yeah, because you know they would just they would just add these taxes on, so you you'd end up, you know, calling maybe every few days, every week sometimes, just to save money to your wife, you know, yeah, and just to yeah. say hi. And now you know now you have you know FaceTime for free oh, from anywhere. Yeah, right. you know you're in the van or you know not even like the van, but I mean you know say if you're in a car going anywhere between the airport or whatever, you know you can just say hi and you know right. yeah, it was really different back then. I mean, and but everything was different. I mean it was. The places were more, they weren't as homogenous as they are now. Everything was sort of the same now, you know? Yeah. You know, you, ha- you had McDonald's and you had, like, you know, Burger King and all those kind of franchises, but now everything is sort of everything. Yeah, you, you know, know, it's we, all we the call same. it Neon, Neon Boulevard. Yeah. Or wherever you just like drive into like every city and it's yeah. identical. Yeah, and it's much, much more homogeneous now in the States. Yeah, that's well, crazy. Wow. You know, the thing that really. For me, the first time I heard you, uh, I was 14. My mom came home from like a record store in, in the city I grew up in, in Rehobot, and uh, she came back. She had Secret Story that mm. did, like had Matini's like oh, wow. first, okay. I, you know, and you did a few tracks yeah, out there, and right. I think that was like a real produced kind of thing. And from there, I got into the Matini group oh. stuff. Oh. But there was like the flash vibe for mm. me. Like, I never heard symbol like you know to me that was something that was like I didn't know what it was mm-hmm. you know what I mean like I didn't first of all I didn't have any sort of background in those days like you know in jazz and, but like you know it sat in such a different place mm-hmm. in the music mm-hmm. right it's like it's it was like I couldn't hear it like I didn't hear in the, it that was like before I knew how to separate a mix in my mind so it was just like this I remember this magical metallic tapping like yeah. going on in the like just like coloring the music and it was like you know there's such a fundament to me playing with you you know like because uh, you played on breaking the cycle in our last chapter of dreaming two, two of right. marvin albums and it's like the one thing that really impressed me what, what was it was twofold first of all you walked into the studio you didn't really know our music and we were all just like you were just like one take yeah. boom yeah. and it was just like you know seeing our music kind of interpreted through your eyes and also we grew up in an age now where it's like gospel drumming is really huge and people exactly. with that kind of chops which just sounds like I don't want to say mechanical but it's like the coloring of the music and putting an arch to the song like mm. like somehow somehow like you know building some sort of like understanding where the song's going that solos need to grow come down and then like kind of making your parts paint the atmosphere like you know I, I just how how did that come about for you like with, with especially like you know the flash ride and this kind of I guess mentality of drumming where it's not just like playing parts or just you know like playing into songs like yeah well I, that's like a twofold question yeah. so I mean the flat ride thing I you know I heard now he sings now he sobs with Roy Haynes so mm-hmm. that was the basically you know, but it just fell in love with the flat ride sound and that's different you know it's kind of more of a Yours is so much it's a, brighter. Yeah, and like, it's a different sound. Yeah, like it was very, very unique. But like, how? I, I don't know. Like for you, like growing up as a drummer, yeah. like how did it take that kind of direction? Of just well, I always was more interested in the melody and the harmony than than the, the rhythms. I mean, so like I don't really think of drum beats as beats. I follow the form. Mm-hmm. So if you you know, in fact, yesterday at the uh, Chicago College of Performing Arts, there was a jazz form. So we were working. One of the combos is, is called ECM combos, and uh, 
So the really good drummer, but the way he was playing this sort of tune, he was kind of, you know, playing this a groove. And I said, no, I said, you know, that there's, you know, there's four bar, I think it was like one four bar phrase, one three bar phrase, and then two four bar phrases. So I said, you have to think that way. So you're actually, th you're almost like playing the harmonic rhythm. Mm -hmm. So there's tension and release, and it's longer, you know, kind of uh, development. And you're actually inside the music as opposed to just laying a foundation rhythmically for that. So that, and that's just natural. That's just the way I heard things. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was in marching band in, in high school, I was, you know, the, the leader of the, the marching band. And I would just, I actually chose to play cymbals and bass drum instead of snare drum, mm. just so I could highlight the music, even though it was marching music, you know? And I guess that's just the way I've always thought about it. So that's why, like, with your guys' music, even though, you know, I just walked in, it made sense to me. You know, I like to play music that makes some sense. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to kind of just figure out what to do, and just the music played me as much as I played the music, because I heard it and just reacted to it. So it's like, you know, having a conversation with someone that, is interesting and makes sense as opposed to someone that just kind of scattered and you know just goes all these different directions and, you, and by the time you're done you go what was that all about <laughs> you know? well you know because there's music like that sometimes you go what what was that you it know? seems like the people right now that are get I think and I think it's because you know there's like so much uh, like just I mean some 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 listeners are just so shallow you know and it's like and, and that's when you have like no listening skills, it's like you you expect a certain kind. It's almost like the people from the other side of the screen watching the movie are determining what they accept. And like you know, like especially with drumming, I hear it like you know, the lick kind of player. Mm -hmm. right. It's like that's really like you know what people are are hoping to hear. Like these like extremely polished, worked out things. And to me, it's like oh, I always equate it to you know being the kind of person that like memorizes segments from books mm. and then like looks for life like for opportunities to like sh shoot like shit out it's like quotes right. and it's then it's like you, and there's never like a, a good time yeah. you know it's like yeah. and real technique is about like learning how to learning the motion mechanics and just making yourself an instrument for the moment yeah or, like when you have an idea you could just somehow shoot it out exactly. in real time but yeah I think the thing that's so my mysterious about the way you think is that so much of it seems to be like um, you know natural because for, for a drummer wh when a guitarist or a piano player tells me like he follows the melody and the harmony uh -huh. it's like to me that means something very specific but I'm not sure if it's like you know when you say it like you know I guess like ha from perspective of a drummer what are some of the things like you listen for? Like you walk into a studio and you, you know, you mm -hmm. hear a song for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I listen to like you know, there's tension release, there's cadence points, you know, there's emotion in certain you know parts of a tune. So it's basically that's what I'm reacting to. So it's not like I'm just reacting to you know a certain chord or a right. certain melody. I'm reacting to, to just what it does to me emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then I just and, that, and I react to it. Yeah, that that's sort yeah. of how it is. And so it makes it hard. I mean, you know, it is funny because what you were saying, like with drummers, for instance, like a lot of times the drum community they're looking to be able to transcribe someone's thing and like you know practice the lick and all that. Uh -huh. And I just never thought about that that way. And and even there was one guy one time oh, a couple of years, well several years ago now, but Matheny kind of transcribed some of my parts. And when I looked at him, you know, it was sort of they made sense, but I don't know if any drummer would want to necessarily play this because it wouldn't make sense just as a lick or a, um, or as like something fancy that they can throw out and impress people. And one of the things I always remember, I, I did an album with Eugene Fries, a really great cello player. And so later on, I did a record with Paul Winter, a guy at Grammy nomination, I remember. So we were in Paul Winter's studio, uh, and the, the, the control room was downstairs, and we were, uh, you know, the drum, where it wasn't a drum room, but where we put the drums was upstairs. So Eugene said, hey, can I listen? You know, I said, sure. So I, I played down this one tune. It was like, well, I think the first tune on that record, Earth, uh, uh, yeah, Earth Voices of a Planet, that's the name of the record. And so it was in five and had some different meters. So I'm playing, you know, and then when I'm done, you know, Eugene just looks at me and says, oh, okay. And then when we went down and listened to it, what it sounded like in the music, he just looked at me. He went like that because all of a sudden 
it fit in the music in a uh -huh. way that wasn't spectacular if you just listen to a drummer by himself, but what it did to the music was what blew him away. And that's, to me, that's what I'm always looking for, you know? Well, and you don't run out of ideas when you do that, because there's always new input from new music. You're not like playing a certain amount of licks that you've worked on, and then you have to regurgitate wherever you can. That's the thing about the real, real pocket is like that. You know, not, it's not just playing in time. You know, mm -hmm. it's like and it's the difference between like, you know, I don't know. So so many people play in time, but it just doesn't help the music, right? right? It's like if you can really hear your part as. You know, like if you can view an independent musical part and just see how you could make an interesting shape that makes it an, a better thing. That's right. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's why we get along. Yeah. We understand that, you know. Not everybody does. And, you know, I don't ever say that's right and, and other things are wrong. You know, it, there's people like certain things for whatever reason. But for us, for instance, that's really what works. Yeah. You know? Well, but, yeah. I mean, it's like there's, I always say that, like, you know, like, stupid music exists because there's a lot of stupid people that love it. Stupid music is for mm. stupid people. But like, I don't know. It's like, I, I, know I know you're not with that mind, but it's like, for, I mean, I, the way I see it is, like, you know, if you're going to be, if you're going to make something beautiful, you, you know, generally the people that show up to hear it yeah. are going to be the people that have the skills to, to understand something beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. It's like, you see it on the world, right? It's like, you know, there's... Like, there's music that's massively successful that's not, you know, I, I'm sure you've had the experience of, like, listening to it. It's like, what are what do people like here? Yeah. And, I mean, you know, I teach all these courses, you know, at Roosevelt University, like, rock courses, and I teach a social justice through sound course that I made up. And it is interesting, because even when you go back, I mean, there's always been a lot of really commercial pop music. I mean, yeah. You know, through, through the ages. Uh, because that was to try to sell as many records as possible. So that, that's your aim. And I don't like to say stupid or dumbed down, but there's a common core of things that s seem to work that most people can relate to. Because really, I mean, think how much music you listen to and how much music I've listened to and read about and study and practice. You can't really expect everybody to do that, you know? No. Like, I don't know a lot about, like, you know, plumbing in my house, you know, so you call a plumber because there are experts at doing that. So I really don't fault people anymore, you know. In, in the old days, it was like, why can't everyone hear this? But, um, you know, I remember being in college, uh, there was this girl, and, you know, we never went out, but, you know, she was interesting, she was nice, real pretty, and, you know, she was into God, you know. So... And she was a music student too. And God, I remember, God, God, she, she, God, yeah, God, like God, God, God. Okay, God. So I thought it was like a seventies no, band. She was I don't a, know. No, she was into God, you know. And then so I gave her uh, a Love Supreme by John Coltrane. Uh -huh. She couldn't stand it. Ah, oh. you know. And to me, that you know, that is like not life prayer material. That's to like why you would bars. Universe. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, right. You know. So you you know, and was she dumb or no? No, she just. Just wasn't there, you know. She hadn't even even arrived there yet, or maybe she'll never arrive there. But that's definitely where she was then. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, there's all sorts of things. What well, I don't know. You, you, you're an educator. You work at Roosevelt. Yeah. You get to teach a lot. Mm. Um, what's What's your stance on, like, do you believe in talent? Like when you when you look at your when you look at students, do you think that like. I'd say what do you, like you see it all the time like is is what, what how do you see like talent versus people's ability to just kind of just learn right that's a good question I mean there's a little bit of both I mean I think for instance like my pitch and my sense of tempo that's just I don't know where that comes from because there were no other musicians in my family you know mm -hmm. It wasn't like I came from a musical family and it came from genetics or something like that. Where my daughter now, because Barb's got perfect pitch, mm -hmm. my daughter can sing. I mean, when she was a, a baby, you know, all of a sudden, you know, she, uh, we, she see movies. So even like Napoleon Dynamite, she can sing that back perfectly and, mm. and memorize. And she still in can. Tune. Yeah, in tune, perfectly in tune. So that's part of it. But uh, to get back to your question, I mean, it just depends on what kind of music. I think if you can hear... If you can make sense out of things, like I was saying, like, you know, I hear form right away, you know. Mm -hmm. If you don't hear that, and then, you know, people, you have to teach, well, this is a two-bar phrase, and this is a four-bar phrase, and this is an eight-bar phrase. They can learn it. It makes it a little harder than someone that just kind of can just do it. When you say you hear form, how, how do you mean? You mean, like, you know, you can hear, 
the length of the length of the phrases yeah. in, in, in music that makes sense. It's just yeah, I mean you know, like playing with uh, you know the late uh, Larry Coryell, he had that tune "Good Citizen Swallow," and that was a fifteen bar phrase, you know, yeah. fifteen bar form, and it never had a problem, you know. And yeah. then he would trade, and I, he'd do eights, I do sevens. I mean, it just it wasn't like I went, oh, this is a weird. Oh, well, where's the where's that last sixteenth measure? No, it just made sense you, because musically it made sense. You know, like, with you, I think also it makes sense. I think the the thing about your personality that makes it make sense to you is how relaxed you are when it comes to playing. Mm. Because, but like, I don't mean like you know relaxing your body, even though that's true too. But like I I distinctly remember taking you to the studio to record in our stuff. Yeah. You maybe heard the songs once. Yeah. We were having pizza, we were drinking wine, right. and they're like, okay. And then it just like sat down, you just like, like listen to it once, so like, okay. And then just like played, and you know, and that was it, you yeah. know. But it's like a lot of people, I think, when it's when they know a performance is due, mm. like they shut down, Over. and they, and it's mostly, it's almost like they get so into like the first two measures of a melody mm. that they, like and afraid what they're gonna do there that they don't let themselves listen to the whole thing once and just take it in. That's a good point. You know what like I mean? Overthinking too. Well, yeah, yeah. It's just you get. It's almost like if you're too zoomed in on the moment in like a micro kind of way, yeah. you can't see the big picture. And that's what you're saying. Like right. you know, to listen to form, you gotta somehow take the whole song in. You just gotta, you know, have some sort of listener skill that's like relaxed enough to just take a few steps back and be like, oh yeah, that's just like that melody. It happens to be seven bars, yeah. but. That's how that melody goes. It just sounds like this. I'm gonna play it. Exactly. You know. And to get back to your student, you know, the things about students. You know, some people like I was always wired for speed. You what know? do you mean? Well, I mean, even taking the drivers, like when I was uh, in high school, you know, they when they're learning how to drive, they had, they had a no, they had a reaction, you know, test your immediate uh -huh. reaction. And mine was like so much faster than anybody else's. Yeah. So like life is really slow to me. Everything is just like I feel like oh god, you know, because I. Had, yeah. So if you can react fast, if you have fast reflexes, you know, if you're healthy, yeah. If you know you don't have any physical problems or, you know, I mean, all those things kind of add up to making you have an advantage, at least the beginning, you know. And then you have to perpetuate that by studying the music, being in. Because you know you can be really talented. I mean, nowadays I was just talking to Talia. I mean, she's you know she loves ice skating, and she's talking all these little kids now that can do all these like things yeah. that you know would have won the Olympics you know twenty <laughs> years ago. Now and, you know you see a drummer like on there's some drummer on YouTube, a four year old drummer. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, so you start seeing this stuff, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be great later no. down the road. No, I mean, they may well, abandon it, or you know someone might keep it going. You know, there's been there's been people that were really talented as young people and they stuck with it and they get better and better and some people just go and they become a lawyer or something too sure but and also like a prodigy is somebody who the, the impressive thing about it is somehow they understand the world of adults aesthetically right. Right. And, they, and they can tap into it well they still like are in a children, child's body but mm -hmm. like there's a big difference between participating in that world and playing like a nice group with some fills yeah. and you know being buddy rich oh yeah right? exactly. it's like the word like you know you just take the whole idiom up a notch yeah. you know with like the power of your personality and imagination yeah and like somebody him though you know he could hear you know because supposedly he couldn't read music yeah so you know he'd have the band play it something like you know it's complex arrangement down once and then he had it down yeah and he could you know he'd hear not only the whole tune but he'd hear like what the, you know the wind woodwind section was doing with the brass i mean he had everything going on and that's just ridiculous talent, you know. And then he had his own sound, but he was wired for speed. I mean, he was really fast. I mean, yeah. But he had this great individual thing. Some people don't like it, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I I won't mention a bass player, a really famous bass player, I played with that w once said that Buddy Rich was the worst drummer he ever played with. Really? And yeah, you know. Yeah. It doesn't sound like that to me, but no, no, of course <laughs> not. But I mean, to this bass player who was really, really famous and played with many great drummers. He just couldn't stand, the, you know, the way Buddy probably just took over, you know, or, or played, you know, like a lot with his foot or something like that, you know. Sure. So everyone's kind of looking for different things. I mean, even, you know, if you look at beauty, you know, some people might like, you know, a tall blonde girl. Some people might like a short, overweight, 
you know, sure. Latino. I mean, whatever. I mean, you know, we all have different things. And so that's what music yeah. too. Yeah. But so still, it's, it's within a range, right? If you like take the eye and move it here, then most people won't like it. Well, no, that's true. Well, some people <laughs> will. That's the ones, you know, right. That's the ones that, you know. Like, that, but to me, that, that's where it slide in, slides into postmodernism because a lot yeah. of people can take uh, the fact that aesthetics is a wide range into a lazy place, like an excuse for laziness, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there's, there, and I think that's a, a real, like today that's a very important point to stress out, like even though you can be great in a lot of ways, yeah. there's still a lot of shit to get together that oh. everybody who's great has in common, right? right? Yeah. It's, like, it's like it doesn't, like Ornette Coleman, you may hate him, you may love him, but he's a great player, and he, like a lot of the things, like his sound, his sense of time, he shares it with anybody who's great. Well, but I was just gonna say, it's like even talking to you. There, look at this. There's a passion yeah. when we're talking about something. Yeah. So all those players have passion in what they do, no matter what it is. That they, they're they're putting it out there with love and, and as much of their soul as possible. And you really care about music, like, right. You know, you just for like that's the big. I think that's a big mystifying people. Yeah, mystifying thing for people is that how come these people want to just make the air move in a pretty way. It's like it's an insane kind of thing to dedicate your life to, and like you know, if you like, we get it. But like, if we had to explain it to a Martian mm -hmm. that just landed here, it's like, what are you guys doing? It's like, I'm playing this piece of metal on these skins. It's like, I'm I'm moving these strings, mm. you know. And it's like, and together, it's doing something. that makes us. It's like, it's very. To me, music is really the closest thing to magic. There's no touch, you know. It just kind of, it goes into your body, and then these things. Emerge, Absolutely. right? Activates your humanity somehow. That's, that's that's wild. Did you ever? You know what? What I've never seen before, mm. like, and I've had, you know, people in my band, people that are, you know, I've never seen anybody go from a place of not grooving mm. to grooving. Like I've never seen that transformation in front of my eyes. Like, does you teach drummers? Like, have you seen that? Like, yeah, I've actually helped people like, learn what like, that is. How how do you? show somebody like that's the thing that to me is completely mystifying how, somebody who like doesn't understand how to put that thing that like makes it animated and yeah. alive yeah and then like what wh how do you how would you explain that to somebody? part of it is like for instance say say if someone you because you have you know a metronome that so that you have perfect time but that necessarily doesn't groove that's no. the tempo so a lot of times with my students and, and even ones that say or having some difficulty and just like you say grooving you know you put on like a great feeling track something that's really grooving and that can even be with machines or whatever I mean you mm -hmm. know I, I, there's like a album called Deep Forest they had a gr it, which was uh, came out in like 93 or something great tracks with two uh, French guys did this record and this is electronic music electronic music mm -hmm. with samples of like you know Aborigines and, and all sure. kind of you know different music. So you put that on, and then you have people play with that. So if you're working on a rudiment and, you, and you're playing a paradiddle, which is right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right. So if someone's just kind of going, like, you know, it's like okay, it's kind of screwed up. And then if they try to do it to click, they could go like, you know, it's going to be stiff. But then if you got something, do do and you fit inside the music, you start listening. So now you're not only working on like yourself, but you're trying to fit in like the music is playing you, and the music that's playing you feels really good. Yeah. And then supposedly like all the molecules, they start lining up, and I've really had results with that. That's incredible. And the more you do it, then all of a sudden like you get used to playing. So you time. you take a context that's grooving. Mm -hmm. But I, for me, my experience is we call we always call this. Uh, the elephant and the mosquito. Mm. This, uh, you, you, you ever heard? No, what's the, that? The, okay, so it means that like, that, well, you see it in the 70s, basically. Like seven, 70s music, it, like the formula to me always seemed yeah, unbelievable drummers, the worst bassists, mm, like nice. locking in. Right? You told me that actually, like ten years ago. You're like that's like that's it's good to have a shitty basis. <laughs> no, 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 it's <laughs> not that, but a simple bit. Yeah. I mean, because someone's got to hold the fort. You can't. Everybody can't be sure. flailing because then you have no context. Sure, sure, just sure. I, I I agree. Yeah. But, but the elephant and the mosquito is yeah. like you know the the story is that the elephant is running in the savanna okay. and the mosquito is sitting on his back and then he looks behind and he goes, look how much dust we're making. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, you 
know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I never heard that's really funny though. <laughs> right, right, that's perfect. Yeah, so that's, that's how I feel about like, but you know, with bassists, you really see it. Like, you know, especially when you're in the studio and you're isolating tracks. Yeah. Some of them are in there deep, yeah. right? Playing the simplest part, but it's pulsating. Right. It's inside, right. it's interlocking. And some of them just, you know, throw their part at the drummer, right? Yeah. And it's like, that, that's the thing. It's like, how do you, like, create that, I don't know how, what they call it, like, um, glue, that well, magnetism into the, hear yourself in the context of the music. Yeah, but if you do play, I mean, for instance, like, um, we play with Richie Patterson, Richard Patterson, who was Miles' last bass player. So he plays with Dave Sanborn and, you know, Boz Skaggs and Michael McDonald. And, like, you know, when you play with him, I mean, it just feels great. And so I'm just listening and locking in and then, you know, the power of two becomes this thing. Yeah. And if, you know, if you're playing with the bass player, just kind of playing the notes that's in time, I mean, hopefully you could make them groove a little bit more, but it's basically going to be in time, but it's not going to have that thing that you're talking yeah. about, that magic kind of yeah. groove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and that's, a, that's an amazing thing too about like the way different people play time. It's like, you know, there's a real difference between, you know, like I, I always say about pocket that it's kind of it's a game of basketball and you're just adjusting the size of the hoop and mm. the size of the ball mm. and if it's like a very huge hoop and a very tiny ball yeah. it's like you know what I mean it's like you can't you don't really want to hear like Michael Brecker soloing over like Tom Waits and it's like fucking can't get can't. and then somebody playing like thirty seconds oh notes. I see what you're saying it's not gonna fit and then you don't want to hear Tom Waits singing over Dennis Chambers mm. you know mm. so it's like the game is kind of, if you're playing super swampy everybody's playing super swampy and that creates one kind of pocket well, and then chemistry that you're it, talking about you know yeah and matching people's aesthetics right too. And that uh, it's it seems like uh yeah n now like you know we've additioned people to the band like i i, I will no longer play with people you know that don't have a solid jazz background because mm. it's like it seems to me that a lot of people that are playing jazz now haven't heard a lot of jazz like you know it's like it's like it's so weird because you know i when i was like you were probably some of the first jazz music i heard in my life wow. you know what i mean i it, i i heard you before like i heard pat metheny records before i knew who miles davis or charlie parker yeah. or louis armstrong were but some people wouldn't consider that music jazz either that's crazy that's what's interesting yeah but for me, you know, I was always into listening to everything I could possibly get my hands on, even in high school. You know, I'd order records from France or, you know. But when I think about, say, 1970, okay, so you have the music, like, first jazz recordings, 1917, right? And, and what, the original Dixieland jazz band. So, so if you think 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, that's like, you know, 50 years. Now, you think, another 50 years yeah just the sheer amount of stuff that kids have to try to listen to and backtrack from and, and backtrack yeah. from the amount of songs i mean because you know when we grew up i mean you had your standards you know all the things you are soft and more sunrise you know you just had you know tunes that everybody knew at a jam session now oh yeah, yeah what yeah. i mean yeah and, and also yeah the you, styles too you know well all, the, the i don't know when the last time you were in a jam session well, it's been probably, a while it's probably been a minute but it's like you know People now are afraid to get up, you know. Are they really? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's like, you know, it's it's almost like, um, and 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 a lot of the sessions have become so, like, uh, free in a way, right? It's like it's almost like people are playing standards, but you can't really recognize anything because it's like I, I had this experience going to Berkeley, you know, mm. uh, where it was very clear to me that this game that we're playing that's called jazz mm. that means a lot of things to a lot of people yeah. right and it's like really the infiltration of like you know avant-garde modern jazz free jazz like you know it was like i went to chess school and i just wanted a classical chess education and then i was like with sitting across from people who were playing checkers with the pieces and then mm. some people were like just chucking <laughs> pieces at each other yeah. you know and it's like you go into this room where you're supposed to play songs but it's like this, it's almost like the game got so broad mm. that unless you get your group of guys and you have an aesthetic, you sh that's why you should have a band, right? Yeah. It's like share an aesthetic that, that way you can kind of define, maybe not even verbally, but like define the parameters of this art form that you're trying to make, right? Well, listening habits have changed though too, because I mean, 
in the old days, the records, you know, we didn't all have the, uh, every record. Yeah. So your friend would have a record. You'd go over to their house and you'd listen to them together. Right. And you'd, start, you'd make comments on stuff. Now everyone's got their eye, you know, their earbuds <laughs> in. And so that's completely changed. Because, you know, I don't even like to say I'm a jazz musician. I didn't like to say I'm an improvisational musician. Because jazz, to me, has a, you know, a certain connotation now that, um, you know, it's a good connotation to some people, a bad connotation to other people. And even though I love playing the music, I, I do play other kinds of music. Sure. So I don't want to be typecast. But the thing is, you know, any of this music, there's, there's a certain uh, camaraderie, there's a community. I mean, jazz used to be, you know, people would get together. And, yeah. and they would listen, and they'd play, and they'd hang out. I mean, so even when I was younger, even with the band Earwax Control back then, you know, we would hang out all night and talk about music and, and go, you know, it was like we were living it together, yeah. though, not separately. Yeah. And it's harder, I think, for a lot of kids now. I mean, you know, there's so much going on. Every, everyone's so distracted. You know, all this stuff that supposedly makes life easier, you know, I think a lot of times just ends up taking time away from what you could have done if you weren't so distracted all the time. Wow. And and that's a and that's a habit. You know, having good concentration. I remember, you know, my concentration was always good, but after I'd come back from a Matheny tour and I'd play at Andy's or something, you know, I could play and concentrate the entire time where sometimes other musicians, you know, they'd play and then they'd be looking at, you know, the bar or the girl sure. or something. Yeah. So you know, you're used to, you're used, used to, yeah. you're used to performing, right? right. You? Used to performing, and that 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 becomes like a habit. That's like a muscle that you develop. Yeah, and, and not everybody do. can do that if if they're not used to doing it or don't, they've never even done it. Then it's really like, what are you talking That's about? So we were just playing uh, Cruise to the Edge, and I was talking. Me and Danny were hanging out to, talking to Steve Morse. Oh, and, wow. uh, and Steve Morse, it was like telling us like, you know, it's like life was hard like you know back like back in the 70s we built our own instruments and stuff and we're like dude we built our own business <laughs> but yeah. but you know but like he thinking about like you know when like dixie guys and people like that started you know first of all audiences were just it was probably pretty boring to be at home right mm. it's like you could read a book watch like a few one of a few channels on tv or go out where life happened that's right? true and, and, and television even went off the air at certain times right at night. Right. right right so, so it's like you know but i think the, the thing you're talking about that's so incredible, you know, boredom. Mm. That brought, boredom is a precious thing. Mm. And in your phone, you have people, Harvard educated people, that are capitalizing on that hole in your heart mm. and trying to make stuff to, to take your boredom right. away from you. Right. But boredom is the thing inside us that's, that's telling us, it's like, Paul, you're wasting your time. Mm. Go do something important. Go get a better life together, right? Go practice. It's like, you know, sure. it's like, how can you, how can you sit on the couch when your triplets need work, right? right. It's like when you're 15, that's amazing. Right. right. It's like you need that kind of thing to get you fired up to do something. Yeah, I always say that, you know, as a musician, it's impossible to get bored because you could always listen, read, practice. There's always something you can do but with you, the music. To too. me, that, the thing that I've seen on people, especially you know, younger people, is the th and I could never relate to that. I could never understand caring about what you sound like. Oh well, yeah. You know, it's like to me, if I played like shit, I feel like shit. Yeah. Nobody can help me. I'm in. A, I'm in a hole. Like if I just had a gig, mm. like you know, and people were fucking up, and like you know, there's an audience there, and like you know, somebody, I don't know, ended your solo early, like did, like all this shit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and it's like, it's in your mind, you sounded bad. To me, that's enough to really like drive me crazy, mm -hmm. right? But you know, I think a lot of people, if they get the compliment, the right, handshake right, right, exactly. after that, it's like, oh, maybe I was great. Yeah, right. You know, it's like I don't yeah. know for you, like what you you listen to yourself. It's like you know, yeah. when when you have a good day, you're happy. I'm assuming, like you know, you care. I know you care about what you sound like a lot. I've made records with you, so of it's course. like you know. Well, but you know, I've come to accept though the bigger picture sometimes too is that you know I used to be just you know like obsess about like one hit on one you know the whole record was ruined because I did something I didn't <laughs> like which like 10 years later you go I don't even remember what that hit was it sounds yeah. fine now but now you know now when I play I just re I just go for it I'm not worried about it because you do have to have some kind of point where it is an adventure and you know it's like with sports I mean you know whoever it is if it's Tom Brady or you know you know Shaq or whatever you know if they always made the hoop or they always threw the touchdown it would get kind of boring right so but they're, if they're great it's like you were rooting for them 
And but their batting average is enough that it's great, and you want to watch them. Whereas if you're just terrible, and every time you know every every time you throw a basketball and misses the hoop and stuff, you're not going to want to watch that. But the thing is, they do take chances, and I think music has to have the, that danger in it too. Because yeah. it, it used to be dangerous music, you know. People, <laughs> people. I mean, you know, in the twenties, thirties, forties, when you know, you just played, and and like you know, you wouldn't be able to auto tune or you know. Put, be detected and change things. You might not be able to to take another take. So right. you'd have to live. You know, you better not make any, any mistakes because if they love that take and you hit a big clam, you're gonna have to live with that clam the rest of your life. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's. I mean, I think that's the, the real lesson that playing a lot of shows really teaches is mm -hmm. that like you know, people are listening. Like you yeah. know what? Like just in the same records really changed something like you know fundamental in music in the sense that like it seems almost like that's the point but you're playing like if you're playing music every day especially like you know touring playing right. for people it's like what you're playing goes into their minds and yeah. changes how they feel that yeah. that is the thing you're doing the records might be like a way of promoting it or taking it home but i don't know i, I had this the weirdest experience thinking about like audiophiles you know mm. people who like are obsessed with super like you know buy like a hundred thousand dollar system and it's like what you're doing is you're taking a hologram mm -hmm. of of something that happened, right? Okay. But these people, if you play like a nylon, a ten, like a nylon string guitar in front of them in a room, they don't give a shit. <laughs> like you know what I mean? It's like it's not the thing. It's they're not like there's. It's it's amazing. It's physics, right? Yeah. It's a natural phenomena in a room as true to the sound as it could be. But yeah. they don't care unless you make a hologram of. If you put like a Neumann from like the fifties <laughs> through like a yeah. hundred thousand, it's like. Listen, it sounds just like that thing. I don't really care about if I ever see in my That's real really life, funny. you know. And a hundred thousand dollars is cheap for all. Yeah, things. right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, people level. spend like you know multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to have, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just would imagine these people just like listening to a cargo bus. Yeah. Do you hear that? Like yeah. the wind. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> like, I know. Everything's amazing. Well, we're all. Everyone is different, you know. I mean, yeah. But that is true. That is. That's pretty funny. Yeah. You know. Well, you're more accepting of people than me, obviously. From <laughs> I guess. I mean, you know. Well, you get older, you know, and after a while, you know, you just realize that people have, no one's perfect. And, you know, I think if, if people have a good heart, then you can kind of, like, go with the flow to a point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's probably pretty true. Well, that's awesome. So, yeah, man. I was thinking about, um, there was a story you told me back in the day. I, f I forget. Uh, I think it was Buster Williams. You're, uh, oh. you were playing with him, right? Uh huh. And what it was the was Beatles? Story? The Beatles story. Oh, wow. What What was that? Can you tell that? Well, I guess. I mean, Buster was a great, incredible bass player. Great, obviously, nice guy and everything too. We played a little bit together with uh, with Larry Coryell, but just yeah. I mean. Um, one time we were like touring Europe and I, I remember we were in Austria or whatever and you know I, I had like a CD case with me like about 20 CDs and half of them were like rock and half of them were jazz. This is like when in the 80s? Mm, when would this be? I don't know. Probably mid. I think. No, I think it could have been. It could have been either in the 90s or the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. But no, I mean, so he just looked at you know um, what you do at my stuff and, and just said. And you know, I had the Beatles twenty, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so I just happened to say that I thought Paul McCartney was a good bass player, and he just asked me, he said, "Well, play me something that you think is good." And um, so you know, I gave him the headphones, and I and I put on Paperback Rider because uh -huh. you know, again, these were the hits. You know, this wasn't all sure. the things, and you know, because it's a cool, it's not a interest. I mean, it's just a cool sounding bass player, yeah. right? And so you know, Buster listened to it and you know, took his headphones off and he just said don't ever play that shit for me again <laughs> you know but the thing is you know I, I could understand it because like someone you know talking to him even about stuff you know those guys older jazz musicians at that time when they were younger they were really having a good career and when the British invasion came in it ended things it ended things yeah. so I you well, know they were the pop musicians right but, but you know can you imagine being like someone who's great as Buster you know like playing all these tunes playing with the greatest musicians and then you see some some British guys come in these you know teenagers they're playing two or three chords and they're making all this money I mean so I think it had more to as much to do with that yeah because you know Buster could have easily played paperback rider 
but you know, it's it's more or less just that's I guess that's what I'm talking about in general. I don't think people are stupid, you know, because they like simple music. I think it's just people look at things differently, and sometimes you know if you're an expert at something, it might be hard to kind of go back and look at something that's really simple, and and think that you know you know why would I think that that is good, you know? Because yeah. I hear I'm playing with him and I'm playing with Larry Coryell. So, you know. Well, I, I wouldn't say, I don't think that like, you know, all music that is simple is, uh, is bad or something like that. But I do think that like, there's a certain kind of amount, there's an amount of complexity um, that's necessary to survive repeat listens. And that, and I think it's present in every Beatles yeah. song. Like, and it, it could be even in a human's voice. Yeah. Right. You know, it's right. like they're in, in the way they're saying something, like in a Johnny Cash song, like you know the way they enunciate or something. So. Yeah, Bob Dylan. Yeah. You know, people that that don't sound good. Yeah. By but, standards, but they're amazing. Yeah. They, they, exactly. But right. the amazing thing, like you know, the, the amazing experience has yeah. complexity built in. Yeah. My problem is, you know, and you see it with the way that, like, you know probably hits of the last 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. it's like no like they literally have a shelf life of a month some of them right you know exactly. it's like oh, and, yeah. and it's like it's so disposable i mean yeah. i don't know like like a guy like like perry nielsen or something like that it's like you know the songs are still great you yeah, know it's like yeah, you, you right. can hear them like 50 years later right. it's not it's not an, you know it's not like charlie parker to where you know, in terms of like complexity, but like there is something there. Oh yeah, and, sure. And but I mean, I think there's a there's a level, uh, there's a level of um, I wouldn't a level of simplicity that if you go under, your music becomes very temporary, even if it's successful. Because it's just there's no reason to revisit. Like I don't know for you, like I'm sure there's a lot of music that on first listen, you get everything that's mm -hmm. going on, right? Okay. You know, it's like and and like why would you come back, right? It's like. And, and it's fine. Well, you know, it's like reading a magazine. You know? Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> the, you know, this, uh, I, I, there's two things that I, I want to mention. So that one, sometimes like when you auto tune and, and quantize everything, you take away all the gray areas that makes music more three dimensional. They're more interesting. Mm -hmm. So next time you listen to it, you, you hear it this way or that. Because if everything is just coming at you this way, it's like yeah, you've heard it once. Yeah, you, you pretty get much it. know it. But what I was going to to talk about to finish this other thing that we were talking about with the Beatles is that. You know the book Notes and Tones by the great drummer Art Taylor? No. Okay, so Art Taylor, you know, he's on Giant Steps. Mm -hmm. So there's a book that came out like in about 1971. And um, so there's about 20 questions, 25 questions, all asked of the same, um, the greatest jazz musicians, Ron Carter, you know, Freddie Hubbard, um, Carmen McRae, all these people. And uh, one of them, or two of them were about the Beatles. Okay, everyone said the Beatles were terrible. They really? couldn't sing. They could all of them. all my favorite jazz musicians. Carmen McRae, I think, was the only one that said, "Well, you know, they've got some good potential, or they write some good songs." Everyone said it was bad. Ron Carter in that in that book said, "Rock music will never last because people can't listen to loud music for very long." <laughs> so, here's the most brilliant musicians, the nicest guys, you know. But again, their take on their reality was different than, you know, what this other thing was happening. And, and Art Taylor, I mean, you have to read this book, it, it will blow your mind. Because there's some really good statements in there, like, you know, that's, I think, like Don Bias in that one says, you know, if you make a mistake, you're only half step away, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. But in general, you just saw that, like, you know, these people loved this certain type of music called jazz. They were the best at it, and this other music really just, they couldn't really hear it. It was just like, you know, for instance, it's like, bu like realm, Buddy yeah. Rich, you know, was, you know, that whole thing about like country, you know, it's good music and bad music, and the whole thing with country western, are you allergic to anything? I'm allergic to country western music. But, you know, to me, I could listen to George Jones or Don Williams, you know, or Patsy Cline, and, and it's, yeah. it's soul, it's white soul. Yeah. As, as opposed to African American, but it's still great. And yeah. You know, you listen to Bob Wills. You know, I mean, that, that stuff swung sure. really hard. So the thing is, I think to you know to be open minded, but not everyone is open minded about everything. And, and you know, sometimes that, you think you're open minded, and you like you know I don't and know. And then someone else will come. Yes, yeah, right. like you know, some some people are showing you like Gent or EDM, and so 
or like you know a power gospel or something like that yeah. like it's not that I, again yeah there's there's places i think each each and every one of us are not willing to go as a listener and that's fine too but yeah it seems to me like you know what what the what these jazz musicians were were saying about rock it's just exact exactly that thing that like there was a paradigm shift in mm. the audience and and I, to me when i'm listening to sinatra versus the beatles mm -hmm. i can see something from the perspective of let's say a uh, frank sinatra 20 year old listener okay. lady who's like you know the, the by the time the bobby shot yeah right but yeah. yeah like those that generation that's listening to polka dot and moonbeams mm. and it's like you know about a romantic like encounter between two people and there's like some strong kind of depiction of a situation and some real attempt at meaning mm -hmm. like verbal meaning kind of like you know where all of what like European art was headed right that's this express to, like the, the the idea that like you know great art needs to like drive a point home and just expand on it in a beautiful way mm -hmm. and then you have like come together where it's like you know it's more like more modern painting, right? It's like the the words maybe you let them in and something happens, mm -hmm. but what's what's the narrative, right. right? It's just like images and you know meaning itself got kind of lost. So for for a person that grows up in a world where a great writer and a great singer conveys like something that's like the point of it is very clear. It's a romantic narrative, mm -hmm. right? Into like this world where all of a sudden everything is abstract. That's right. a big leap. Oh, that's, definitely. Like the leap of rock was really, it wasn't, I, I think that, that's one thing about like when you listen to like, you read like Zeppelin lyrics and stuff, mm -hmm. it's not meant to be taken in the same way. It's like, it's almost like speaking to a different part of the brain. Sure. Right? You know, and then you look at blues. I mean, you know, you have guys playing like out of tune guitars, dropping beats, but unbelievable. You right. know, great lyrics or their voice, the way they could convey emotions. But to someone else, they might think, well, that's just some guy, you know, like, yeah, but what is that? You know, th they're not hearing it. We don't, you know, not everybody can hear a lot of things. You know, opera could sound weird to some people. Right. You know, it's just, that's just the way it is. Sure. But with all that being true, you know, you specifically have evolved like, you know, like a great drummer. So obviously there's a competitive edge in there, right? It's like, you you know, you wanted to, you wanted to crush it. It's like, you know, it's like the, that, that drive is really, is really real. So it's like, if it's conscious or subconscious, mm -hmm. I think like you need to have some sort of competitive edge somewhere deep inside you to where you just want to strive. And you know, it's not, it, yeah. just like be at the top of your field, right? right. Like, but know, if you love it, you want to do it. That's why, right. you know, it's like it's really hard to tell a student go practice because if they don't want to practice, don't practice. Yeah. Well, well not only that, <laughs> but if you don't want to practice, like why you why you don't you have any passion for this? Like you're saying to get to get better to to learn something. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's hard to practice for everybody because you know they have different you know, jobs or you have different classes and stuff like that. But in general, you know, music. You don't have to practice physically either. You know, you can think about music. You, yeah, you know, you're on the train. You can either listen to music or you can think about music. You can right. write music, or you can just listen to the sounds of the train around you, and that's going to influence your music because of of the rhythms that you might hear, or, yeah. or you know, so you know, or the lyrics. All of a sudden, you hear two weird conversations, and you put them together. All of a sudden, now you have lyrics. Well, so just being constantly open to what's around you to make it somehow work in what you want to convey as an the, artist. The thing that you're talking about is, I think, the psychological tragedy that most musicians that are not good find themselves in, or not mm. good yet, is wanting to become, not wanting to work, right? Wanting yeah. wanting the six-pack, not wanting to go to the gym. Right, right. right? Sure, you know, sure. wanting the intellect, not but hating reading. Yeah. So it's like, if you want to be the man, but you hate practicing, yeah. it's like, that's not what, you know, what, what you want is a fantasy of being the man. But right. like, you know, you've never, you like to take like, you know, a couple of steps inside John Coltrane's mind yeah. means living John Coltrane's experience, which is like saxophone all day, all, of, all yeah. your life. Going to sleep but, with it in your Yeah, right. just, that's how, I mean, yeah, yeah you, you know, it's like just being obsessed. And yeah. I mean, for you, like, I want to just get into like the, a little bit of the Latini experience. Like, yeah. how is it? Just walking into like because you you joined in right after off ramp right, 
So yeah, right after off ramp and right the first tour like travels was coming out. So they had recorded travels and then and then I was in. Yeah. So that so that already was huge, right? It's like these big tours. No, not not necessarily. When did it get like very big? Sort of a little later. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's a funny story because um, obviously when I got, you know, for I got just a, a local drummer in Chicago, you know, all of a sudden he turned the world was, was, was amazing. And like the first tour of Europe, I mean, we, we played Hammersmith Odeon. We played some large venues for a lot of people, but then we also played clubs, right? Well, we played clubs. I just remember playing in Le Mans, France, and this is in the wintertime, and, you know, there weren't enough people, the, the, the venue owner didn't even turn the heat on. Oh, okay. you know, so we were playing in, like, inside, like, with, with winter coats. So it got better, I think, you know, off, um, especially once, I think, they went to Geffen, you know, because ECM was wonderful. But I think all of a sudden we started, you know, the, the budget got bigger. So we became, you know, the biggest group. For yeah. jazz and you know, blue first class and all that stuff. But at first, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily like that. Yeah. And I always tell this funny story about be careful what you ask for because um, sometimes you know I'd be on a plane or whatever you know, and you'd start talking to someone. They'd say, "Oh, you're a musician. Who do you play with?" You know, Pat Metheny. Some people, are like, wow. More more than not would be like, "Who? I don't know who that is." <laughs> so on the way coming back from uh, Switzerland after recording with Bowie. You know, I was exhausted. We were up like 51 hours or whatever, you know, flying back on TWA. And so I got off at, at um, O'Hare. And so I'm going through customs, you know, and they say, you know, what are you doing? I'm a musician. Okay, you know, who, who, are you, who are you playing with? And I thought, okay, instead of who with the thing, I went, you know, Dave, David Bowie. And I went, who? David Bowie. And he said, put your stuff over there. And then they went through everything. And so I went, okay, maybe sometimes it's better to be not that famous, you know, because with Matheny, it was always, you know, no problem, because we, you know, we didn't do drugs or anything, you know, right, we, we right. just we never like did. bringing a suitcase right. of acid, masculine. Right, right, but, you know, I thought, and then I, I was, it was so funny, I was just like, oh, man, yeah. you know, be careful what you ask for. That's crazy, well, I mean, yeah, that, that's so wild, I mean. So what was the last record you were do, you did with Matheny? That Imaginary Day. Imaginary Day. Yeah. And, and that was great. You know, it got three Grammy nominations and won two Grammys. So that was, that was a good time to, the, you know. Yeah, because then Tali was born, you know. I mean, I've never missed a, a birthday. You know, I, I don't think I ever missed, like, a first dance or performance. I mean, I wanted to be a good dad yeah. as well. And it, it, really, it really worked out. I mean, you know, I'll knock on wood. Yeah, Something yeah. Right. Talking about that, Danny just had his baby two oh, days no, ago. Oh no! Yeah. Know, oh my yeah. God! Oh wow! Congrats! Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Boy or girl? Girl. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. And he's booking. He's booking us like crazy. Is he? <laughs> well, booking. I mean, you got to make a living too. You know, how you put food on the table. So you want to try to balance that out. I mean, obviously, we wouldn't be playing the music we want to we want to play if we wanted to become rich. That was sure. never. You know, was never. I want to, you know, I want a yacht, I want a, you know, a couple houses. I, mean, I never care about that. I just want to be able to have a nice life where, you know, you feel reasonably comfortable. You know, you're not always worried about the future. But it's a great balance now because I'm a tenured, you know, yeah, professor at Roosevelt. at Roosevelt. So now I could be home, have dinner, but I can tour. I'm going to Italy next week. Then, you know, in April I'm going to China for two nights. Who are you playing, playing with them in Italy? Uh, well, my, I have a trio, two great Italian musicians. We have an album called Free the Opera, where we take Puccini and oh, yeah, So, yeah. yeah. And then um, then going with Farid Haq for just two nights at Beijing, the Blue Note. Then I'm playing this really great Russian guitar player uh, and, and, and uh, Dominique Di Piazza, a great bass player, yeah. in Russia in May, you know. So yeah. I, I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do, you know. So it's, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Because you know, also, it's for the school, it's good because then I want to still play and I want to bring home stuff too you know sure well and in the theater days how many days were you gone a uh, year what was a typical well, it was year a, it was a non and off year kind of thing so you'd be gone you know eight nine months or whatever in the year and then maybe nothing eight but nine yeah, months yeah wow. yeah we, 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 we did how did yeah. Barb take it well I mean it, we did but it was you know I'm sure it was rough because again you know we we're saying that like you know you talk to each other maybe every three or four days but but you lived like there for, like that for 20 years yeah right? yeah yeah, <laughs> no, it's finding the right person, you know, and thank God. You know? Yeah, 
Yeah, because it, it's hard. You know, like, sometimes you come home and it's like, hi, you know, who are you? You know. Yeah. And yeah. then it's the thing that was always so funny is that, they, I, you know, she would get used to me not being there. So all of a sudden now, you know, I come back and like now you're putting your dishes here. Yeah, it's like, you know, and I'm <laughs> taking up space and stuff. So it takes you know, there's like a t it takes about a week, you know, because like when you're gone, then you miss each other a lot for the first week or two, you know. And then yeah. you kind of get used to like the routine of what it is, and then you've got to readjust. But after you do that enough times, you kind of know, okay, this is like here we are. It, you know, I just got back, so you know, it's going to take a few days. To, you know, it's like jet lag or something. Sure. You know you're going to get back on schedule in a couple of days. Well, do you remember the early days of being gone all the time? Yeah, sure. What, like, what, what was that like for you? It was hard. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because I mean, I'm kind of a homebody. I like being home. Yeah. I really do. So I always wanted to be home, but, you know, I was also, you know, it was great to tour, obviously, with that band. I mean, it was, you know, how much better can it get than that? So it was like the best of both worlds, but you know we made it work. It's, how, it was in those days, yeah. like when you guys first started playing with the Matheny Group, how did it work? Like this was like early '80s, yeah. but there's all this stuff in the music, right? Like there was like, like how did you guys like play with all the, like the percussion sounds? Like how big was the band when you joined? Well, when I joined, it was just five. You know, because that's that's when Pedro Aznar joined. Yeah. So he, you know, he was singing and playing guitar some bass and percussion even though you know you know he how, wasn't really a how'd you guys pull off like all the stuff in the records well like, again you know we did play with with sequencers okay you know so there was like a sync levier back then with that the, what did what did that gear even look like back then it was big you know <laughs> and i mean <laughs> that stuff broke one time i think one time the sync lever broke you know we were in europe somewhere and i think it cost pat like two grand just to even have it fixed just that day, you know, and you think about, you know, probably it was like eight meg of stuff or something. You know? <laughs> like a floppy disk. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's like you a know? scientist yeah, getting well, like a well, floppy you, yeah, you, look, you know, like all the keyboards, and now people just have it all on their computer. You yeah. Know? But, no, that that's... So, like, you ran tracks through monitors on yeah, stage? You, yeah. Like, no, blasted yourself with, like, sync yeah, clip yeah, yeah, no, no click, ever. No way. Yeah. And the... Man, that, that yeah. So we're playing in twenty two eight with a sequencer, <laughs> you know. Imagine doing that. I can't imagine. Yeah, dude, I can't imagine anything before two thousand ten. Oh yeah. It's like before, like <coughs> you know, in one sense, we are like, hello, thank you, <laughs> hey Bob, what's I'm up? Leaving. Okay, they say goodbye. Hold on. Yeah, I'll see you later. So we'll go out then. Okay. Have a good day. I think I will be home. Too. Okay. So. Yeah, that's that's so crazy. It's like you know, in one sense, like you know, you probably didn't have to handle the nitty gritty of promoting, booking, no, no, tour no, managing. No. Like you, well, just, that's the thing that was really great. Yeah, yeah, because you had people that had to do it because right. it was a job. Right. Now it's not a job. Now it's like you can get your cousin to go on his phone if you don't want to do it yourself, oh. and you can figure out all the shit. Right. Yeah, it's like right. like India and the Move has all the venues in the world. You gotta you go there. You look at what you, is India on the Move? It's India. The, the, Indy? On the oh, Indian. In, okay. Indian on the yeah. move, like uh, independent, right. right? You go to Google Maps, you route a tour, yeah. you call, you email, you know, you can do everything yeah. literally from your iPhone. Yeah. Then, you know, like we never book hotels. We just go after the gig. If somebody, like we crash with people in the audience sometimes, and sometimes it's like 2 a.m., 2 we just open our choice hotel, pow, yeah. book the hotel right then. It, everything is easy. Yeah. You don't have. To, there's zero planning if you have a phone. Yeah. But it's like you guys were like fucking cowboys. It's well, insane. Well, I mean, we had it easy because you know there was Ted Curland Associates, so we had a manager, an agent that took care of all those tours. So you know when we Did went, you have somebody like a tour manager. To travel oh yeah, with you? of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. And we had a whole crew. You know, we carried grand piano, Steinway piano with us and stuff. So. But you know, you we would get a whole yeah, 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 yeah. We always had a Steinway, yeah. Wow. And it was always tuned before the sound check and then before the gig. But you know, we would get a booklet right, you know, you know, before the tour. It had all the information where you know everything was booked, even if it was a three month tour. Everything was booked way in advance. Oh. You know, with Simon and Bard, you know, there were times you know we could sleep on people's floors or whatever. You know, it was, it was like that. Yeah. Yeah, but I can't imagine now. I mean, with. Um, yeah, just having the iPhone, 
or just having Google Maps and stuff, it, it's so much easier. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's it's easier in the sense that you could do it yourself. Yeah. It's hard in the sense that you have to. Yeah, have to. <laughs> well, I mean, there's still managers out there and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then you not not in jazz anymore. Not really. I mean, like you know, there are, but people aren't playing a lot. You know, it's mm-hmm. like we're really an anomaly. We play all yeah. the time. You know? Well, it's like so. the thing. I mean, you guys have paid those dues, and now it's starting to pay off more and more. Yeah, but I mean, it's like for us too. It's like you know, we actually love. I mean, the one thing they don't tell you in school yeah. is that everybody who managed to get great played a lot of shows. Of course, you can't. You can't like that's does practice itself doesn't do it. Like I don't know, like something about the perspective of practice is too small resolution to start stop but mm-hmm. like when you're practicing your set mm-hmm. and playing you know hundreds of shows a year mm-hmm. right then it's like you you get to massage your entire playing night after night oh, it's like yeah, that sure. part that you missed it's like the night after it's like i'm not gonna miss it. it's like oh shit here it is again yeah. here it's like f- five nights in you're like you catch it right? right right so you get to like work on your playing that way yeah I don't know. Did you ever find that coming home from like a Matheny tour, you forgot how to play all the other things? <laughs> no, but that's a good question because it did. Where Pat wanted me, wanted me to play time wise, you know, because we we're playing with a you know sequencer, and he wanted me to push the sequencer. Play ahead. Ahead. Yeah. Yeah, because he said like if I played in back, even where Steve was, or in the middle, it would be too. The music's too pretty. It would sound too pretty. So like, so without rushing, I, I'd be like the godhead of the the sequencer. Just to kind of like yeah, give it a little bit. Give, give that edge because that you know if you listen to Matheny and Lyle, they play behind the beat all the time. So when I get home, there would be a thing where um, you just got used to playing that way. Well, n- well, no, but then I I start playing. I just start playing. Um, Normal again, and it felt so good. But then I'd go on tour. Then I'd have to, you know, learn how to push again. Is that something that was not natural to you to no, push like that? No, I mean, was I probably you? normally would feel the beat ahead back, especially in those days. Now, you know, I can feel it wherever I want to pl- play. Yeah. So, like some of the bands I play with now, you know, I intentionally like, you know, p- pull that back beat, you know, just to kind of make it groove a little fatter. Back then, I mean, I, I might do that. Chicago and get used to it and then I'd go on the road and then I'd have to push this thing because you know when you're playing with a sequencer it's immovable yeah. you know so it's you, not going to follow you right the only thing you get to do is like you know be decide what you're doing in relation to right it. right right exactly sort of like yeah so that's the kind of thing where um, it didn't necessarily it didn't necessarily I, I didn't forget how to play but you know like when I come home you know if I was playing especially jazz gigs I mean it was all of a sudden, I had much more freedom to play because mm-hmm. with Pat, you know, we had a set show every night. It was basically the same show. If we're playing, well, if you're playing with sequencers, it if, has to be. Yeah, you know, lights and everything. So you know, whether you're playing in London or you're playing in you know, Le Mans, France, a smaller city, it's going to be the same show. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same same length too. Same length. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's wild. So was was the gig with Matheny always with sequencers, or like did you guys? Ever well, I think I think it started, you know, because are you going with me and stuff is with the sequencer. Mm-hmm. So I think they started using the sequencer. I think that's one reason I got the gig is I could play really well with the sequencer. How did you get that skill? Would you, were you, I have no idea. I guess I have good time, you know. Were you practicing with a metronome? No, 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 yeah, no. Just know? like made sense. I played with you know good records, you know, as a kid. So mm-hmm. I think that was part of it. So you know, I mean, because. I think like somebody like Buster Williams, for instance, who's like such an amazing bass player, I think he was a proponent of playing more with records than playing with a click, you know? Mm. Jeff Berlin is like that, too. Yep. So, you know, that way you're playing with some, something that feels good as opposed to just something that's like, you know, just mm-hmm. pure tempo. But as a drummer, you know, in the studio, you've got to be able to play with a click. You know, yeah. if you can't do that... Well, I remember, have, you know, not only like, you know, not only recording you with a click, but also... Like, you know, I, I edited records mm. where you were playing, uh-huh. and I got to see exactly where you put your notes. Like, I, I must have spent, I don't know, 500 hours, uh-huh. at, like, editing parts of it. You were, like, when you were there. And it was so interesting, because it's like, you know, I'm really not, like, a quantizing kind of guy right, right. When, when you don't need to, right. you know. And it was, like, when you actually see on a sequencer, like, the, the relationship between mechanical time and where things land in uh-huh. the pocket, it's like... You know, you're like you know when you're when you're pushing when you're going for like that energetic thing. It's like 
lines have like exactly like a tiny bit ahead and uh-huh. it's like it just great but again if it sounds great it creates that like forward thrust and that's that's where it well that's the be. thing i mean why you know well now people uh, fix it just to fix it yeah but I, what i'm saying is like you know in the old days you know people moved the you know something would be slower than faster on the, on the bridge or whatever but with a click, you can uh, you can approximate that. Yeah, that's the thing. Without changing the uh, actually changing the tempo and tempo mapping, you know, you push here and then you lay back. You know, but you never get off at the click. So that's why you know. So the the click can either be like you know, uh, a needle center, or it could be wide. You know, and you right. can just kind of play within that. When you rush, then you you know you start the, the, this it's that, or when you drag it does that. But in the center. You could move it and makes it sound human as opposed to just the drum machine. Exactly. And even now, like with Word of Cocaine Gray, I mean, David Kane, we, you know, we just finished uh, our seventh record, and on one cut, because most this is all basically completely free and improvised, but on the last cut it was free and, and improvised, but I kind of went into this thing where I'm playing on the one and three, you know, this front beat thing from my book, uh-huh. Turn the Beat Around. And so when he was mixing it, he said, man, the whole thing just stayed at 82. Because he, he, he put some stuff, and he said, man, he couldn't believe that this whole thing... It's just, yeah, it's just like the time. tempo was just perfect, without click, you know? Well, I mean, if you hear if it you in hear time, it, right, right, right. then it's in time. Right, and if you play with good players, everyone is sort of, like, referencing it, so it strengthens where you are, too, you know? Because, yeah. you know, I'm sure you play with people where, you know, you just have to grin and bear and try to play through oh my this horrible feeling, and that's, you know, that's yeah. sad when that happens. Yeah, it's tough. It gets tough sometimes. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I had I had all sorts of experiences, like, you know, with also people who, like, I had, I had uh, one guy in my band, you know, that was a very good musician, just we didn't agree on what music should feel like. Yeah. He grew up listening to machines, yeah. you know, it's like he was like, he really came from, and, he, and that's a kind of like, to me, like, you know, jazz really, like, in terms of drumming, went like two directions right now, there's like, the people who are really like in the gospel mind where everything's kind of like, it's almost like Dennis Chambers minus the jazz. And, and you know, and then yeah, the other... Yeah, is great, yeah. Yeah, and then like the other the other people veered into this like New York thing that's happening right now where it's like approximating, approximating like drum and bass, like mm-hmm. I guess like the, the third generation after John Mayer really. Like, mm-hmm. you know, not John, no, Jojo Mayer, I mean, not John Mayer. Uh, Jojo Mayer, like, you know, playing the drum and bass kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and... He was coming out of that school and really trying to feel time in a very mechanical way behind, you know, the way me and Danny play. Yeah. And we, you know, it's like, it's so funny with like, you know, the way I hear our music, we're, if I can identify with anybody, it's not even like Coltrane's band, it's, it's Charlie Parker's band to where like the band is just grooving yeah. and you're the soloist is the way the, the the type of interaction is more like framing mm. the form rather than following in the moment and creating these like you know climactic things every second i mean we do go into that but not as much mm. right but now it's like it seems like drummers and bassists are really in the forefront of jazz records right much more than like, like just as much as the solo oh, like yeah. everybody's like fucking with time right, fucking sure. with harmony yeah it's just the kind of interaction now is just like everybody's firing. Yeah. You know? That, that seems to be the thing. Yeah. Um, all right. Anybody? We have, we have some people watching. Anybody have any questions for Paul? Or <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we go. Yeah, we're probably going to wrap this up pretty soon. Yeah. So, get, plug in some. Th- so, what, so what, what kind of stuff are you, are you putting out lately? Like, oh. Well,. Okay, so the, like I said, the Word of Cocaine Gray uh-huh. came out with our seventh record. It's going to be mixed in stereo, but also 5-1. But we also did a, we, we filmed it all in, in 360. So mm. people will be able to kind of like go or watch whoever they want to watch in that. So, and that's going to be called, going to be called Without Compromise, that record. Um, without Compromise. Without Compromise. And, um, because we don't, we don't care what anyone thinks. <laughs> we just, we're just doing what we do. I mean, Dave Kane's really you know uh, plays keyboards and sax really great with like mixing and mm-hmm. mastering and you know and then yeah, Larry yeah, Gray's yeah. playing bass and he's great and everything yeah. um, then this is really funny but there was a there was a Polish label called GAD G-A-D that found like the first a data of the first gig I did with John Mulder and, and Eric Hochberg in no. out of Buren 
Germany. So that's 25 years ago. So that's coming out, right? I want to copy that. It's really good. <laughs> it's really incredible. I mean, we, the sound of it was a little hard because the bass was really low, but I mean, you could really hear the guitar and drums. I was like, okay, that's fine. Yeah. You know? So we call, I call that first date because it's, it's that record. Um, Howard Levy just re released these two things. There's one, they were both unreleased. Uh, one's called the NBV Quintet, Mo Bad Vibes Quintet. And this was stuff uh, from 1980 and then a couple of things from 1983. It's unbelievable. Some of my huh. best playing. I mean, I was listening, I was studying it. We, we did this again. Oh, oh my God, you know? Because we were so dangerous back then. Yeah. And then there's one called the Harmonica Jazz Quartet, which came out in 1987 on cassette. But that's actually really good, too. There's that, um, let's see, Fabrizio Macabre, the piano player with the, my trio in Italy, he just came out with a new tango record, so that I'm on that. Um, there's a and with a band from Italy. Um, there's a guitar player named Romando Melalupe, and the same bass player from my Italian trio, Gianmarco uh, Scalia, and then John Hellowell, who's the sax player from Supertramp. We have a oh, band no called way. Open Frontiers Project, so that's coming out. So you know, that's great. Yeah, and there's yeah, I mean, it's just kind of. Tons of stuff like this, just like records and records and stuff, it's, which is really exciting. It is, you know. So, what do you think that is about, like that Howard Levy thing from like the eighties? That's like that makes it like your great playing. Well, like it's really back. dangerous. I'll play it. I'll play you some yeah. of it. You know, because I remember that session specifically. We did it at Steve Yates' studio in Skokie, Illinois, and I remember Kelly Sill, the bass player, was on it, and Kelly and I played some together, but not a lot. And I just remember at the end of that session, he goes, man, you play so different than anybody that I've played with, because rhythmically, yeah. and now when I listen to it, I go, yeah, I mean, this is some serious, it's unbelievably great. I played it for, <laughs> I played it for um, Brian Peters, my yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. friend, yeah, and he says, man, it sounds like Tony Williams, only better, yeah. which is like, I'm not saying, yeah. but that's what he said, you know. It sounds, it's so dangerous. Yeah. We're playing over the bar lines, but so together, it's incredible. And it wasn't, I mean, it's just so, when so you're, cool when you're so young and yeah. you're getting back an opportunity and it's like i think the thing is you're afraid that maybe you're not as great as you hope you are so you just play the shit out of it to prove it's like you know it's like ah <laughs> you know just crush <laughs> probably but also that's the way we all played that yeah that's right I mean, you know because chicago you know ha has a tendency to be a little bit you know more groove oriented blues oriented you know it's, mm -hmm. but th there was also a lot of people that just played like going for it you mm -hmm. know and we weren't afraid you know yeah. we didn't care and usually those I mean so that band has like Steve Eisen who's this amazing sax player um, Dave Urban was this trumpet player that was really good but he died mm. recently you know and that's an interesting story because Howard found out that he died and he kind of died he was selling streetwise you know mm. he had kind of like ended up I don't know is, is homeless but um, they did a piece on him I guess on the news where People in the neighborhood loved him. They would let him watch their kids and stuff. He was like, but he had some whatever problems, you know, that made it really hard. And then there's a couple pieces where Jeff Check, the bass player from Earwax Control, mm. is on there. A couple live things that we did uh, where Kelly isn't on there, and it's just, it's just crazy, how, you know. And you know, we had a sense of humor in the music. I mean, we kind of had like a whole list of emotional. Now, now I'm just curious going for, for sure. Yeah, I'll play, and it's recorded really well. I mean, I was like, "Oh, you know," and and when you're Howard, gonna have to send me a a, a link to that because people want to hear. hear oh, you okay. Playing on those. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, if you go to if you go to my Facebook page, okay. You know, because it's also available on CD Baby. You know, we can. You know. Sure, I'll share it on the Marvin page later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's really yeah. Well, when we're done with this, yeah. I'll, I'll play you some some of the new stuff. You got to hear this. I yeah, mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, but the dr there's a drum solo on that first date record that I played for Vic Salazar from Vic's Drum Shop. He's like, because I'm listening, I'm like, what am I doing? You know, it's it's so cool to hear. Because when we when we play, we're just playing the at the moment. It's that's, not that's like we didn't lick, we didn't do lick 25 followed by lick 73 and stuff. And so you know, it's almost like hearing it. Who is that person? Right. You know, and that's what I think art is supposed to be. It's right. like a growing process and immediacy that really I think. 
is what music is as opposed to like a painting where you can go back and fix it later and all that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it it's is what it is. in the moment. So you, you, like you were saying, even being on tour, every gig is going to be a different thing because, you know, one day you might be sick, one day you might be tired, one day, you know, you're really in a great mood, one day, whatever. And, well, you know, all that stuff matters. That's the thing about improvising that's so strange that I find, like, especially like when you play the same music again and again, mm -hmm. that's supposed to be improvised. Yeah. Improvisation, all, especially when you're repeating a situation, it aspires to stop being improvisation. Mm. It's like it's trying to be like this worked. Mm. Like you know, it's like you know, like you try a bunch of stuff. Some some nights are better than others. Then mm. like it's so natural to just lean into the part of the solo that's got the reaction. Oh. You know, to to play that thing that you know you can do, yeah. right? That's gonna do it. But it's like. The more you lean into the familiar, yeah. the less it's, it's like, you know, the moment gets better at the price of the actual thing that it is. It's like you have to find that place to make, you know, still take risk. Well, I mean, for me, when I solo, like, I just kind of make it up. Right. But, you know, a lot of people, when they solo, you know, they make some of it up and then they go back and they do play their favorite lick or whatever. And even like somebody like Charlie Parker, you know, yes. Charlie Parker, because he would have to play sometimes solos that were recorded because people want to hear like, did he, he, can he really play that? Right. So not everything is always just like, hundred percent fresh. And we are who you know we are who we are. So you know, but I just like that's why I, the way I teach my students. I mean, when they you know when I have students say you know, uh, especially like private students, you know, they come and they say, oh man, you know, I'm just running out of ideas. I said that's impossible. Right. Because you can do this, and then if you do this, and then you go here, oh, okay, well, that's a different thing. And then you do this, oh, that's different. Now speed this up or make a 16th note into a triplet. All of a sudden, that it's impossible. You know, add some dynamics, add some accents, add it, you know. There's too many parameters to actually many, repeat. Yeah, it's yeah. impossible. <laughs> yeah. It's impossible to run out of ideas well, if you think that way. Yeah, that's true. If you I, think, I think only you can only play what you practice, then you are. But being ideas. stale is a state of mind. People just well, feel true. stale. You know, yeah. it's like so that. The, right, that's the, true. That, that's that's really the thing. But yeah, I mean, if you're really in there, uh, like, I think a lot of times, like, you know, the, like with my students and people on the feed, I always talk about the appropriate place for where you put your consciousness mm. when you're when you're improvising, mm. and it's like the way I say it, it's like. You, it's like a lot like driving. Mm -hmm. If you're hyper aware, oh, yeah. that's like it's you're you're ruining everything. Right. Like you need to just be there that's and right. observe. That's right. right. You so look one, you're, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like everything's automatic. Yeah. You just trust yourself that you've done this. You you're gonna steer this that's whole exactly thing it. right. But it's like it's like a foreman overseeing a big project that right. has a lot of and like if like the you know the drum head breaks, it's like mm -hmm. okay we're. We're zooming here because yeah. we need to like work around. But you can something. make that work. That's yeah. the thing. You make it work. You <laughs> exactly. Know? But like, yeah. yeah, it's being real and having real facility and control. But right? like, if you you can be a driver, but it, you know, say if your peripheral vision isn't very good, or say your reflexes are slow, then you can be a bad driver, even though you're doing the right thing. Sure. That's why a good driver. I mean, I haven't gotten a ticket since like 1973. Sure. You know, it's just like. Everything makes sense to me, and everything moves slow to me. It's like I just see things, and you know, you're able to, you know, yeah. just do that. But if you have good peripheral vision, you can go and just go like, you know, this far from between cars, and no problem, just no yeah. problem. But if you don't, you're going to hit people. So a lot of like you were talking about talent, some of it is is natural ability. You know, you can't really. But if you're texting, then you are. You know, <laughs> Then, you know, I don't even want to see you. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll leave the people with that. Don't text and drive. Yeah, really. So, dude, Paul, okay, thank thanks, you so much man. for doing great, this. Great, great. Hi, everyone. Great. Bye. <laughs> see you guys.